It is my great pleasure to introduce our second keynote uh, speaker, uh, who, uh, as the saying goes, doesn't need any introduction. So, but nonetheless, I'll, I'll, I'll say a few words because we are truly honored to have Vittorio Gallese uh, as our keynote speaker tonight, if only because along with Giacomo Rizzolati and Leonardo Fugassi and other members of the Parma team, he was part of a revolutionary discovery that gave empirical substance to the mimetic turn, thereby fueling new interest in a return to an embodied, relational, and affective mimesis constitutive of what we call here homo mimeticus. Vittorio Gallese is first and foremost a neurologist and is professor of psychobiology and cognitive neuroscience at the Department of Medicine and Surgery of the University of Parma in Italy. Is the recipient of many awards, including a doctorate honoris causa from KU Leuven in 2009. So we're delighted to have you back. Um, he's always careful not to reduce the psyche to the neurons that fire in the brain, always ready to acknowledge literary and philosophical precursors like Dante or Merleau-Ponty, for instance. I would say Galeza demonstrated phenomenological acuity as he noted something strange in the macaque brain that made him and the Parma team wonder, how come the sight of a gesture generates an electric discharge in the neurons that should be responsible for movement, yet are activated by the mere sight of movement? Drawing on the classical mimetic trope par excellence, they called the strangely mimetic neurons mirror neurons and set out to articulate the implications of this discovery for, the human, for human phenomena as well, including empathy, theory of mind, and of course, imitation, a discussion that is still in progress and evolving. Thanks to this discovery in the 1990s, an old philosophical idea linked to a tradition of the mimetic unconscious attentive to what Nietzsche called psychomotor induction and Gabriel Tart described as an innate tendency in the brain to imitate, which was much neglected in the past century, is now back on the theoretical scene to think and rethink mimesis for the present century. Vittorio Galese is the author of over 300 scientific publications that bring his protean mimetic sensibility to bear on the relation between the sensory motor system and cognition by investigating the neurobiological and bodily grounding of intersubjectivity, psychopathology, language, and aesthetics. He's also the author of three books I highly recommend, The Birth of Intersubjectivity with Massimo Amaniti, The Empathic Screen with Michele Guerra, which develops an experimental aesthetics that integrates neuroscience and film studies, and more recently, Embodying the Self, where he articulates a new model of perception and imagination he calls embodied simulation theory, which posits intersubjective mimetic relations as central to subjectivity, aesthetics and effective forms of communication along lines that support the hypothesis of homo mimeticus. His keynote today is titled Narrative as a Body, Embodied Simulation and its Relationship with Fiction. So Vittorio, the screen is yours. Well, first of all, thank you so much for your most generous uh, introduction. Um, um, I'm, um, I'm very uh, not only delighted uh, of your kind invitation, but also honored uh, of the privilege uh, to give uh, a keynote lecture um, at this time of the day. So <laughs> it's a real challenge, but uh, uh, let's see what, uh, what's coming out. I like this image uh, because um, some anatomical traits of the face uh, are rendered uh, as uh, variously uh, shaped uh, uh, words. Uh, so the title uh, accordingly is uh, as follows, narrative as body embodied simulation and its relationship uh, with fiction. One of the key reasons that uh, uh, drove me as a cognitive neuroscientist uh, uh, to the wonderful arena of uh, uh, the symbolic dimension, uh, the aesthetic uh, uh, slash artistic uh, uh, dimension of humans uh, 
uh, is the realization that um, a difference of uh, even our closest cousins, the, the non-human primates, uh, we seem to be uh, pervicaciously uh, uh, in need to create parallel worlds. We are not happy with the, um, it's getting harder to define it as such, physical reality, uh, because this physical reality uh, um, also contains uh, a parallel replica, which is uh, uh, mediated by uh, technological uh, uh, dispositives. Nevertheless, what drove me into this uh, uh, interdisciplinary territory is the realization that this multiplicity of parallel worlds, the worlds of fiction, um, is crucial uh, to define who we are. As, uh, as an animal species. Um, so uh, it is not only legitimate in a sense that people like me uh, try to address, uh, even in a very simplistic way, some dimensions uh, of this uh, distinctive character of, uh, uh, of our species, uh, but uh, it's not only legitimate, but it's a must. <laughs> if we if we want to do cognitive neuroscience, where well, there's nothing more cognitive than our proclivity uh, to create uh, uh, fictional uh, worlds by painting them, uh, rendering them three-dimensionally, or uh, uh, by means of uh, uh, telling and listening to stories. Uh, as humans, we are literally obsessed by images and stories. We create images, we narrate stories, uh, we like to look at images uh, made by other conspecifics, uh, we like to listen to story told also by other conspecifics. As uh, Michele Cometa uh, uh, recently uh, wrote in this book, uh, why stories help us uh, living the necessary literature, the narrative behavior, begin quote, uh, the narrative behavior has in fact given shape and strongly conditioned the development of the cognitive abilities of homo sapiens. And therefore, studying the narrative means having access more or less direct to the functioning and structure of the human mind and with the mind also of consciousness. So we could start from this question. Why do we care about literary characters? Uh, of course, there are many uh, possible uh, answers uh, to this question. Uh, one answer which I don't particularly like uh, is the adaptationist uh, uh, like uh, um, uh, answer to the question, uh, peacock tail and those kind of things uh, that ethically, uh, 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 is paired by, uh, let me be crude uh, with this light, uh, a particular way of looking at the relevance and uh, uh, necessity of uh, um, literature, fictional narratives. Uh, uh, I, I'm very much here uh, uh, with uh, Susan Keen, who in 207, uh, in, in this book, uh, Empathy and the novel wrote, begin quote, a society that insists on receiving immediate ethical and political yields from the recreational reading of its citizens puts too great a burden on both empathy and the novel. Um, I totally agree with, uh, with this. What interests me is, uh, 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 not uh, uh, um, uh, novels, but um, uh, the practice of uh, fiction, producing fiction and uh, being related to fiction to experience what we call fiction. And I, I dare to venture on this territory only and exclusively uh, because of the um, acquaintance and friendship and uh, um, scientific collaboration with uh, uh, Hannah, uh, Professor uh, Wojciechowski, who is Professor of English and Comparative Literature at the University of Texas 
at Austin. And we done, uh, uh, we tried to develop uh, a theoretical approach to possible future uh, experiments yet to come. Okay, we, we wrote, uh, uh, we co-authored a paper uh, in 2011 um, where uh, the title was How Stories Make Us Feel. Uh, and in, in those articles, we focused on narrative empathy and the mirror neural mechanism as key aspect of embodied simulation, which is uh, a particular way of uh, uh, describing uh, how we make sense of other behavior, of other emotion, and to a limited degree, uh, uh, other um, motor intention. Namely, the activation of the brain body during the reading or viewing of fictional narrative. It's an old story, the role of uh, mimetism um, in the relation to, to fictional narrative. We may a few particular cases, uh, uh, and um, we provided uh, uh, an hypothesis on the potential relevance uh, of this mechanism to address uh, uh, um, how stories uh, make us feel, making also clear that we by uh, no means want to restrict the multi-layered experience we make of narrative just on this uh, sort of mechanism. The claim is totally different. There are also these mechanisms, uh, which were, uh, they, they had uh, their fireworks, <laughs> so to speak, uh, uh, in terms of centrality of the debate uh, uh, in the um, aesthetic of Einführung, meaning uh, uh, the last quarter of the 19th and, and the first uh, of the 20th century. Uh, then, it became a carsic phenomenon. Uh, it went underground. And uh, I think uh, it's fair to say, as Nidesh uh, pointed out, that uh, we contributed to revitalizing part of this uh, uh, um, uh, conceptualization of relevant aspects uh, on, uh, on ma of mankind. So today, I will expand the research framework to include other subpersonal brain body networks, the subtend and body simulation in relation to fiction. And additionally, I, I would try to synthesize uh, diverse bodies of research, but very uh, concisely, don't be afraid, on engagement with fictional characters. I'll speak about uh, a little, very little of TV series too. It is to say cognitive narratology publishing the, uh, uh, 2013, David Herman writes of the mind narrative nexus. He claims that, begin quote, narrative is tailor-made for gauging the fair quality of lived experiences, uh, um, end quote. I posit a brain-body narrative nexus, giving embodied cognition a place of greater prominence uh, with respect to um, other perspectives which tend to restrict uh, or, or mostly focus on uh, the explicit uh, uh, use of uh, uh, the usual cognitive apparatus, uh, um, hardly uh, distinguishable from, from language. My point is the following. When we navigate the parallel world of fictional narrative, we basically rely on the same brain body resources shaped by our relation to mundane reality. This is a dynamical shaping, which means that these mechanisms are inscribed uh, literally into our own personal individual history. So uh, from this point of view, the, the metaphor of the mirror is totally misleading because uh, uh, these mechanisms uh, uh, are uh, uh, the outcome of our social practices. So the influence of the social practices uh, in turn uh, literally uh, uh, modify dynamically changes uh, uh, the dynamic responsiveness uh, of this mechanism. So we, we are dealing with the living thing. We, we, we speak of the body, uh, okay? So these resources provide the functional scaffold 
and the building blocks that our engagement with fictional characters rearranges by means of different forms of framing. It's not, of course, only a bottom-up story. It is also, at the same time, a, a top-down uh, story. Cognitive narratology, this is interesting from my point of view, reveals that readers make sense of complex narratives by relying on a very few textual or discourse cues. These cues, which fiction creatively uh, reconfigures, we have different styles, not only different topic, uh, completely different uh, narrative universe if we compare uh, different authors. Nevertheless, are the expression of social habits and social practices that readers recognize because they literally constitute the fabric of readers' lives. Even in the most ex extreme, uh, uh, moving away from this uh, apparently uh, 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 mundane practices, uh, think about uh, surrealistic uh, uh, fiction, uh, 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 the theater of the absurd, or example that uh, um, on purpose move away uh, from uh, mundane reality or project mundane reality with a particular distorting lens. Uh, the claim is even there, you still uh, uh, rely on this scaffold. Reading, in other words, mobilizes our capacities for empathic co-feeling with others a co-feeling that register within our own bodies. And again, I don't want to be too repetitive, but uh, you're never enough clear on this topic. Uh, this constitutes only one part of the story. This is my story. It's not the whole story, okay? But I think this story needs to be told because it's relevant. Habits and social practices. So uh, this is the starting point. Uh, we are, as uh, individuals, the outcome of our social negotiation. And this social uh, negotiation, uh, epigenetically, so to speak, uh, allow me the metaphor, uh, have a strong impact on the way our brain body, the scaffold, works in this particular context. What is a habit? Here I'm with the. Uh, uh, John Dewey, habits might be profitably compared to physiological functions like breathing, digesting, the latter are to be sure involuntary while habits are acquired. Pragmatism proposes a processual and physiological characterization of habits and consider humans as creatures of habits, which are conceived as vehicles of cognition. Uh, much later on, uh, analytic philosophy uh, uh, um, ravaged, uh, uh, strongly disagreed, to, uh, um, to say uh, the least, uh, uh, with this perspective. Uh, people like Fodor um, were considering uh, uh, habits uh, too trivial, uh, 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 to embody cognition. Anyway, habits consist of schemas of perception, schemas of thought, and action producing individual and collective practices, which in turn reproduce the generative schemas. The body with its motor potentialities, this is one of the, I think, most important discoveries that came from our group. Part of your motor system activate, but you don't move. You imagine movement, you look at the movement performed by others. Your motor potentialities uh, contribute to uh, design uh, your social landscape. So the body with its motor potentialities constrains, limits, and dictates the range of possible practices. I can sit, I can stand, I can run, I can jump, but I do not and cannot fly. Um, with my naked body. The body determines social practices, but at the same time, the body is shaped by those same social practices. It is because of the reciprocity of body and social practices 
with cultural artifacts are created here. I, I am uh, very much uh, with the anthropological thought of uh, Tim Ingold, Ellen Dusanayeki, just to give some background. But let's uh, continue with the contribution of uh, American pragmatism. Uh, this is Pierce. The habits give rise to symbolic expressions and produce meanings through wood acts. That's the way uh, Pierce defined them. That is, through dispositional potentialities that are both physical and mental. But it is what I just said before introducing uh, Pierce, uh, uh, speaking about the potentiality of our body. Our motor potentialities, our practognosia, if you want to translate uh, this concept uh, in, in Merleau-Ponty uh, words, uh, shape and define the world we perceive. The definition of habits as disposition, as we just uh, uh, um, heard from peers, can be connected, in my opinion, to the notion of motor potentiality. Our brain body expresses the range of potential relation to the world that lead to the constitution of a relational self, shaping and delimiting the horizon of the world we inhabit. We come to know and understand our Umwelt, to use von Uyck's school uh, um, expression, through the relation of potentialities instantiated by our body. And at this point, uh, even more pertinent is Bourdieu. Begin quote, social agents are endowed with habitus inscribed in their bodies from past experiences. These systems of patterns of perception, appreciation and action allow them to perform acts of practical knowledge based on the identification and recognition of conventional conditional stimuli to which they are predisposed to react. The theory of practice as practice insists, and this I think is very important, contrary to positivist materialism, that the objects of knowledge are constructed, not passively registered, and contrary to intellectualist idealism, that the principle of this construction is the system of structured, structuring disposition the habitus, which is constituted in practice and is always oriented towards practical functions. So there is an intercorporeal side of intersubjectivity. Uh, Nidesh mentioned the uh, uh, mirror neurons, here they are. Uh, um, a more recent study done in Tübingen by the group of Peter Thier compared mirror neurons in response to the observation of a physical agent present in person uh, doing the action with the action presented on a video screen and all mirror neuro respond to both. Uh, half respond more uh, uh, strongly uh, to the naturalistic uh, action, but they still respond very nicely to the film one. The remaining half, no difference between the two. Okay. We are mimetic creature, and uh, indeed, uh, uh, it turns out that the same cortical part of our brain are activated during the execution, the observation, and the imagination of a variety of movement that we categorized as bodily movement, communicative action, objects, transitive, directed actions. Uh, we are mimetic creature. Indeed, we imitate from birth, uh, as Metz of the War revealed uh, in the late 70s of last century. Even macaques do, and uh, when they do it, uh, um, you can record a, a desynchronization, uh, both when they produce uh, these mouth movements, but also when they observe the same movements uh, uh, performed. Uh, by uh, a human being uh, uh, in front of uh, the macaque, uh, the newborn macaque. Um, when we imitate others, like raising your index finger, we activate bilaterally the posterior part of Broca's region that uh, um, uh, clearly 
uh, doesn't deal only with language. When we learn how to uh, play a guitar uh, after observing a video that uh, shows uh, very simple uh, chords uh, and then reproducing them uh, on the arm uh, of, uh, of a guitar lying on the lap of uh, the poor volunteers uh, that were in the magnet, what you see is again uh, a bilateral activation of the the brain parts that activate both when you perform the action, but also when you observe it, plus uh, a sort of orchestrator, a part of the dorsolateral uh, prefrontal cortex. Uh, the same applies to uh, emotions. When we experience a given emotion, we activate uh, uh, this specific part uh, of uh, the brain, the anterior insula, when we feel disgust, uh, but the same part of the brain also activate uh, when we observe uh, the disgust of someone else. The same applies to sensation. Uh, the brain region uh, that uh, uh, is activated when someone touches my legs uh, is also activated when I witness uh, uh, the touching on the legs uh, of someone else. Even when I read uh, um, something that uses uh, uh, tactile metaphors like that man is oily, life is a bumpy road, she gritted her teeth, uh, she has steel nerves, uh, his voice was silky and the like, uh, compared with the uh, sentences with the same meaning but not relying on the same uh, tactile metaphors, gets what uh, part of your brain uh, lights up. Uh, texture selective areas. Uh, by the way, um, Giovanni Battista Vico uh, was uh, making not very different point many centuries uh, before neuroscience uh, uh, was invented. Thanks to embodied simulation, this is my uh, proposal, we can grasp the meaning of many actions, emotions, and feelings of others uh, from within with a, a peculiar experiential quality. To many cognitive scientists, uh, the experiential dimension uh, of uh, life is a plus. It is not even uh, considered. Everything is uh, um, a cognitive strategy, uh, inferences, uh, deduction, logic, uh, and the like. Uh, here, uh, we are definitely in a different theoretical ballpark where this quality of the way we understand what's going on uh, uh, makes a, bit, uh, a big difference. Uh, a quality of experience different from uh, what um, we could uh, roughly uh, define intellectual known. Thanks to embodied simulation, we recognize motor goals, motor intentions, emotion, sensation in what we observe without necessarily having to use inferential reasoning in linguistic form. We can definitely do that. We do it uh, quite often, not as often as probably many people think, uh, but um, we do something else. Uh, 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 we do also what is captured by this uh, uh, model. Perhaps at this level of description, uh, we use bodily inferences. So embodied simulation is the suspension of the actual application of a neurophysiological process. This part, uh, uh, this brain circuit uh, uh, activate, uh, I perform action. Those other different uh, uh, brain networks activate, uh, I feel touch on my uh, cheek. Uh, uh, other uh, parts of my brain are activated, uh, I, I experience uh, a particular emotion like disgust or I feel pain. Those very same brain circuits can be reused, suspended from their usual uh, uh, function to map action, emotion, sensation uh, uh, out there, uh, belonging to uh, other selves, to someone else. Reuse of neural motor maps without the movements they normally determine can be conceived of as cases of activation of a paradigmatic knowledge, the paradigm. The display of the rule exhibited in each individual case of actual occurrence 
some grasping neuron activate, but grasping doesn't follow, no matter if it, it, its display occurs when the action is performed, observed, imagined, read about, be it real or fictional, accomplishes its ruling role because of pre-existing biological norms and constraints which make it possible. None of our experiences is ever direct as all our experiences are mediated by our relational body. Our engagement with fictional characters is cognitively and bodily pre-mediated, here I borrow the notion from Richard Grusey, by our life engagement, which provides the basic framing to navigate the world of fiction. On the other hand, fiction pre-mediates our life experience, as our engagement and identification with fictional characters provide clues and perspectives that can affect how we cope with life's challenges. We can interiorize a literary model. Uh, we can try to adjust our life to uh, uh, that uh, uh, experience by a character. We particularly uh, tend to identify with them. I could continue, of course. Engaging with others' experiences, be they real or fictional, also enables a deeper understanding of ourselves. And I think this is very different from the idea that if I read Balzac, uh, I have uh, a more opportunity to get smarter than if I read uh, 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 20 Shades of Grey or, or something similar. The competence of intersubjectivity cannot be entirely reduced to the subpersonal activation of neural networks in the brain, hypothetically specialized in mind reading, as too many neuroscientists still think. Indeed, neurons are not epistemic agents. However, neuroscience can investigate the experiential dimension of intersubjectivity in all of those parallel words I was mentioning at the beginning through the study of the underlying subpersonal processes and mechanisms expressed by the brain body when people engage with others. What does it mean to phenomenally engage with the self and with others for the point of view of the brain body? How different it is for the brain body when the others are fictional characters? How does our brain body react when we read about or watch Hamlet holding Yorick's uh, skull? And one could answer, who cares? And indeed, many people don't care. Uh, uh, but there are other people that uh, I think that this is interesting because it reveals uh, another dimension of this manifold, which is our uh, relation to these parallel worlds. And, uh, uh, for example, a colleague of mine recently, Broom and colleagues, studied whether identification with fictional characters is associated with increased neural overlap between the part of the brain that are, tend to be active when we engage with ourselves or when we engage with fictional characters. And they selected participants about uh, from people particularly fond of the uh, uh, this uh, TV series, uh, uh, The Game of, of, of um, Thrones. So this question, self-pessimistic, Jon Snow, Moody, were alternated uh, uh, with those of pictures also of uh, um, uh, close others uh, uh, to the participants. Here is the, the paper, a very recent one, Becoming the King in the North. Identification with fictional characters is associated with greater self-other neural overlap. So what the, very simply uh, these results show is that there is a larger response for the self than for friends and fictional others in part of the brain that uh, many of my colleagues uh, uh, believe is the seat of mind reading, whatever mind reading is. Uh, so let's forget about what these neurons are doing. It is interesting. Uh, whether or not the same parts of the brain, whatever it does, uh, uh, show similarity in its responses when we compare ourselves, our friends, and fictional characters, non-existing 
individual. Midline brain regions belonging to what uh, we designate as the default more, uh, mode network, uh, which is implicated in a variety of things. Uh, the more uh, time passes, the less uh, clear is my idea of what this part of the brain supposedly does. But we know that at the very least that it is implicated in self-referential and social cognition. And another part of the brain, the temporal parietal junct uh, junction, um, at the border between uh, the temporal lobe and the parietal lobe. Well, these areas responded more strongly to the self than to close friends and fictional characters. But this is why I highlighted this in red. Self and others, both real and fictional ones, activate overlapping brain networks. However, with different intensities, the strongest being related to the self but there is an overlap. So what interests me here is the overlap. But uh, things get even more interesting because neural responses for self and fictional characters are more similar among individuals who regularly mentally simulate narrative experiences from the first person psychological perspective of characters within the story. So they have this trait identification proclivity. The stronger it is, the less is the difference between uh, the brain part activated uh, by self-related contents and fictional others related content. The more you tend to identify with a fictional character, the more your brain behaves similarly, both when you relate to yourself as well as when you relate to your favorite character. This finding suggests that the more immersed people tend to get in experiences of becoming a fictional character, the more likely they are to access knowledge about that identity using the same neural machinery as they do to access knowledge about themselves. A final aspect deals with the idiosyncratic quality of individuals' engagement uh, with fictional narratives. I'm all, almost finished. Recent studies have shown that people fare differently with their capacity to fantasize and make use of imagination. And we have two ends of the spectrum. On the one end, uh, there are individuals characterized by a total lack of imagery, termed aphantasia. And at the other end, people whose imagery is as vivid as real seeing, a condition term hyperfantasia. Well, individuals with hyperfantasia activated the left sensory motor cortex, so what deals with the, our body to a greater degree than aphantasic and controlled participants, suggesting a potential relationship between the vividness of their mind's eye and the intensity of their simulative embodiment in spite of the purely visual imaginative task they were submitted to. Future direction, new media, narrative means many different things as we speak. New media such as streaming television serials are increasingly taking the cultural place of honor long occupied by literary works, especially canonical novels and dramas. The parallel world has been theorized as narrative ecosystem by um, Guglielmo Pescatore and his group at the Dams in, uh, at Bologna University. Um, according to Innocenti and Pescatore, many contemporary TV series are the result of an ecosystemic design in which a general model is developed in advance as an evolutionary system with a high degree of consistency among all its components. We can therefore move from the idea of text to that of the narrative ecosystem, a system bearing a specific set of characteristics. TV series are therefore open systems. They are comparable to natural environments, resilient in both time and space. They combine and integrate narratives, characters, and users in a specific media space 
in a narrative ecosystem, producers and viewers share the responsibility for their series evolution, because there is a constellation of uh, parasocial practices, uh, website where people chat, discuss the character the development of the story and the like. And here is Francesco Casetti, uh, who in the Lumiere Galaxy, seven keywords uh, for the cinema to come, um, argued that the audiovisual textuality of streaming TV series introduces a novel form of mediality in which the role of spectators is greatly empowered with respect to novice readers. The proliferation of transmedia storytelling generated by the original series narrative, I was mentioning before, transforms the viewer into an experienced user. A true performer, someone who constructs his own viewing conditions, bringing himself to bear directly upon the, of the short quote from Francesco Casetti. So the new dispositive produces a new gaze in a different and more active form of engagement with respect to standard novel reading. The enhanced performative quality of viewers' engagement with the fictional characters populating the serial narrative ecosystems likely contribute to an increase in their attachment to them, boosting its effective quality and intensity by means of the increased intensity of the embodied simulation they generate. Our parasocial relationship with television series anti-heroes have prompted critics to investigate the moral conundrum of our collective attachment to problematic protagonists who commit transgressive, criminal, or even taboo actions like this guy, uh, Tony Soprano. In fictional narratives, when engaging with the characters, we exploit many of the very same brain body resources we normally employ when confronting real others, since both realms are characterized by similar social practices and performative acts. This is a key uh, aspect. Fiction, however, broadens and enhances our capacity for emotional attachment even to transgressive characters whom we would be reluctant, to say the least, to approach or bond with in real life. More transdisciplinary research is needed in order to bridge the divides between research fields like narratology, media and communication theory, visual studies, and neuroscience in order to advance our collective understanding. And this is Thank you so much, uh, and thank you particularly for your patience.